Okay, so this is our first class of our numerical methods in PDE scores. Okay, so this, this, this course, for those um, who want it, it will be, it's been recorded in English, but it's also been recorded at the IMPA website in Portuguese some years ago, so those who want to check it in Portuguese. Um, my notes of this course are in Portuguese. I don't have notes in English, but I think that's not a big problem. You can find it at, at my website. Oops, sorry. OK, so you'll find the notes there. You can download the PDF. So the notes are kind of old, mixed. So if you also find bugs, let me know, typos. and. Um, so the notes are, are, are there. Let me mention that there's no, no really, with the things I present in the course, there's no really no textbook in the sense that there are many books. I can give you the list upon request of the books I put in the library. Ask me which is the book I'm using at the present moment, if I forget to say, because I hop from book to book. OK, the subject is long. I'm going to start with actually with ODEs to, re to set the language, so the way I think of things. Probably some of you have seen it, no problem. So the books are many, many books. Even just in the PDEs, there are books I like more for one thing than for others. I'll mention that, but ask me if I forget, OK? And then I which book are you, you have in your mind right now? And I'll let you know, and most of the books, or all the books are here at the IMPA library and are pretty classic, OK? So, so we're going to start, OK, and also evaluation this course, I'm going to give you problem sets, many. Computational, which here at IMPA, I can give you instructions who are IMPA students to use maybe MATLAB, which you can have access at our lab. Some people can also use Octave if they want, which are, which are similar. There's Julia, which I've never tried. So people say it's also good, so I'm going to put it here. So these are high-level codes. I mean, right, um, systems, software that makes our exercises very quickly, very easy. I mean, easy in the sense of programming. And what I want with, from this, from these, is to, for you to see the theory working in practice. Right? So it really makes sure you understand the theory. So I'm going to give you many problem sets and, and with having computational things. And also, maybe at more towards the end of, of the course, as I do in my courses, papers to do reports. Maybe end, or we'll see at the size of the class seminars. More at the end, okay? So we'll see that. That's just a tentative thing. Okay, I'm going to start as I said with ODEs, that is ordinary differential equations, and I'm going to go quickly on this. Maybe one or two lectures. I don't know how much. Maybe two, because they will be a little shorter. And some books, these books, there are some classic books. And here are um, some authors for these classic books. I'm not going to put the title. So there's Lambert has a book. Gear. Henry C. I usually follow a little. Some of the things I'll follow a little more on Lambert. These are more, these are. Entire books 
on just numerical. So if you put this, you know, Amazon, whatever, you see the full title. We have them at Inver. This is basically numerical, ordinary, differential equations. The whole book on this, right? I'm doing the stability analysis, many things. Very good books. And there's one more introductory, which is a numerical analysis book. It has some ODEs. It's good for linear algebra. We also have it at IMPA, which is Burden and Ferris. More intro. Numerical analysis, and it has some ODs, which means it's not specialized as linear algebra systems. It's a good book. It's more introductory, more undergraduate, and this is more advanced OD, OD, just books on numerical ODs. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking more towards the end of the class today, maybe next class, because today's going to be um, some things I'm taking out of Lambert. This is also very, these are also very good and very famous names in ODs. Okay, so to to set the language, our communication, and so on. I'm going to start with something, some very elementary points in ODEs, in differential equations, and we'll move towards then, of course, PDs, which is our our main theme. Okay, so let's let's start with some then. Numerical ODEs. Uh, don't put it like this. Just start. Okay, and let me start with the scalar case. I think I'm using X as time. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Well, let's think, doesn't have to be, I think as x, as time, just to facilitate communication, I could use t, doesn't matter. So if I have this OD, okay, this general nonlinear OD, right, with initial condition, let me say I'm called x0, yeah. Okay, so how do I solve it numerically? Well, I have actually two choices. I can solve it like this. Or I can solve it like this. Okay, so basically, <clears throat> right, we've integrated here. So we can have this, maybe, let me call it this maybe, Differential form, right? It's differential formulation and the integral formulation, right? And I can solve it. I can solve it both ways in the sense that now I have to go from the disc, from the continuum model, right, to the discrete model. Okay, so I have to discretize. Okay. Okay. So how 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 can we do this? So. The super simple, I mean, things are gonna, I'm going to do here, I'm going to be, I could be teaching this, right, in, in an undergraduate course. So super simple to solve, uh, uh, the, to start trying to solve these equations. So usually we use, mo in most of the methods, not all, we use, um, let me put it here, Taylor series, or more appropriately speaking, you'll see why, Taylor Polynomial. Why? So I'm going to be, right, I'm going to be a little s sketchy in the beginning because it's more introductory. If you have any doubts, please stop and ask me. Well, I can do a Taylor series expansion, or, but since I'm going to truncate it, right, I'm going to talk about truncation error, truncation, all that. I'm going to truncate it. A Taylor series that I truncate, basically a Taylor polynomial. In the Taylor polynomial, we actually have an exact formula for the error. So that's very good, right? So we can think of it what, whatever way we want. So let me write here let, so I can use the board a little better. And also to set notation, my notation, right? Not mine, but the one I like from books and so on. If I write this like this, y 
you know what I'm thinking, right? This is very clear. I mean, no, no big deal. Taylor series expansion. And I want to now set the, the notation that sometimes I forget. Please stop me. Andrea, what do you think? If, if in case I forget, I hope I don't forget, which is sometimes I start using little y for everything. I will try at least in the beginning to make sure to set notation that this capital Y is exact solution of ODE, okay? And then eventually I'm going to use little y of n, which is this. Well, let me let me I'll I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll do this in a second for the solution of the difference equation, that is, of the discretized problem. So let me let me tell you what I'm going to do. Let me let me go with me. So this guy here, I can use. Let me call this star one. We use this star two in a little while. So here I can use star one because I'm saying it's the exact solution of this guy, right? So this is equal to F evaluated at capital Y, blah, 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 right? So if I do this, right, I have, so let me just put it here to save. And now let me start using this notation. Okay, so you already know that this is the exact solution evaluated at discrete time xn. Okay, so basically I have this is discrete time, but it's the, it's the exact solution, it's a function, it's a continuous object. I can evaluate it at any time, no problem, okay? Now, okay, now, and we know what the error is. It's in the notes. I'm not going to write it, right? This error here for the Taylor polynomial, right? It, we can find it exact, exactly has to do with the, maybe I should write it. No, I should write it because of something where let me not get too lazy, right, and write things. So it's, it's important. Okay? So this is, right? That's why I want to write to, so I can also set the notation. And do you remember what this Cn is from numerical methods? This Cn is some guy, we don't know exactly the value, but somewhere in between here, and the error is exact, right? For us, the good, the good news here is that when I do this, and actually let me finish now so I can set the notation, and I write this, You see, here, here I have a difference equation, and here I have a differential equation, right? Look, the, what did I do from here to here? Oh, I'm doing super simple, right? Just Taylor series, I could write this as undergraduate course. I did a Taylor series expansion. I substitute the derivative by this because of the OD. I cut this off. This is the truncation. Right? I truncate, I mean, I throw everything from the, ta the tail of the Taylor series or, right, the error of the Taylor polynomial, which is this, I throw that away. The error is delta x squared. That's the asymptotic notation, big O. There's notation big O and little o. The notation big O means it's a constant times delta x squared. So this is, the OD is, Simple mathematically, but it's good also for us to set the notation, right? So that delta x, right? And when I truncate, this is my difference equation. Okay? So this this guy here, now this is important for what we're going to do, okay? 
this, which is an exact solution, this is a function. This is a vector. And sometimes they just write everything little y. I hope I don't do it. And you might get confused. Well, from the context, you will see if I'm talking about a function or a vector. But I will try to keep the notation, make it clear that capital Y is a function. Little y now is a vector. So I should have written here capital Y. But usually when we write the ODs, we write like that. OK, so I already am doing a little bit of, a little bit of misuse of notation. No, I'm not because I'm not putting y sub n here. So if you have the sub n, you know it's a vector. OK? So this is truncated. And this looks like calculus. This is super simple, right? Because why? Look, I'm going to just I'm gonna do it in erase. If I put this and forget this, this is that, that the approximation of a derivative that we learn in calculus, right? So this is basically super simple. And this is basically our first method. which is called explicit Euler. The most simple one-step method for ODEs, right? It's explicit. Look, it's explicit because every time, everything already depends on, say, the present time. We know the values. And we get the new value, right, by evolving this. So this is very simple, OK? So this is explicit Euler, or sometimes also called forward Euler because we're doing this Taylor series expansion forward in time, like this. We're going from this guy to this guy, OK? Now, doing the same thing, and I'm going to go fast, because it's very simple. I have implicit Euler, OK? And sometimes I would just use it like this, Euler implicit in my notes. You see this sort of. Right, um, acronym just for Euler implicit, Euler explicit. And Euler implicit, which is also called backward Euler. So backward Euler, we do this. So double check that, that you do that with the Taylor series. You go backward in time, and you get this method. So compare these two. They look very much the same. They look very much like calculus. You subtract this, you divide this, an approximation of the derivative. The only thing, if you think of calculus, I'm not even going to draw this, right? But you, you know calculus, of course, is that this guy here, this is the definition of, of, the, of the derivative, taking the tangent on one side of the interval and this would be like taking the tangent on the other side of the interval, OK? Right? Because you're taking the slope here. All right? And this is implicit, right? Because for me to advance from this instant of time to the next one, I need to evaluate my vector field in the future. But I don't know the future. So how, how do I solve this? Let's see, what is a, what is a key word? from numerical methods. It's not numerical differential equations. Something before numerical differential equations. What, what is the key word, key word to solve this numerically? Newton. Newton method. It's like finding the zero of a function. right? You can, you can put everything on this side, poof. This is a constant. Put everything on this side. It's, it's this blah, blah, blah equal to zero. So it's finding the zero of a function. right? And then you find the zero. So it's more expensive. But it's OK. But is it better? Maybe. OK? So I always like in this course say, OK, I'm going to sell you two numerical methods. Which one are you going to pay for? Right? Which one you would buy? Well, you've, you've got to ask me first. Before, as a good, as a, to make good use of your money, you have to say, well, you want to sell this method for me? For which problem? Right? You just don't buy it. Because whatever, even if it's free. For example, this method here, if 
For some problems, I don't want it, I do not want it from free, for free. So for some other problems, it's okay. So you'd have to know for in what context you, you want to use it. Okay, so I'm going to mention about this just in just a second. Okay, so this is the implicit order. So let me mention one more thing here. Let me put maybe different color. Just to be sure. I could have used, I don't need to, it just make, it doesn't make my life much more complicated, but it's okay. But let me mention this because there are other methods which are, are more easy to construct using the integral version, integral formulation of the equation. But I could have deduced these two methods from the integral version of the equation. How, how would I do it? I mean, in words, of course I can use Taylor, polynomial, but, but, yes, both sides. You can use a quadrature from, for, for this integration here, okay? And since we're using quadrature for the integration, let me do a little sketch here, just in this space here. Let's pretend that this is, right, this is F. I don't know what F is, right? But since it's a quadrature, Let's suppose f is a function. It doesn't look like this. It's a caricature, some crazy, right? It's a function. I'm going to use a quadrature to integrate. And both methods are basically, and here's, here, here's the, as we, the hint. Both of them are the sort of rectangular rule, or whatever, quadrature, where one you use one side, the other one you use the other side. That's all. Right? That's all. Double check that. For this method, and you get these guys, the quadrature rule. Okay? So we can use it e either way. And then let me, let me maybe mention, I'm, this, this notes actually I'm using here, which are in Portuguese, which is this thing here. And there's so many pages with, for us here, it's a lot of pages with too little information because there's a lot of blah, blah, blah. And this is because it was a introductory course in a colloquium here in Brazil many, many years ago, so far more for undergraduates, so it's very slow, so right, so I have to fish around the relevant, the relevant information, and I scanned it, so, okay, so you'll see when you read. So another, another, another method of interest, which is my third method here, which also, one way we can do it is through the integral version, is the trapezoidal rule, Now let me write for short like this, right? So we start getting used to not notation, right? No big deal. So basically, this a little bit looks like the average of those, those other two guys, right? This would be implicit Euler, explicit Euler, and I'm doing an average. The name trapezoidal rule gives it away easily. How, what's the easiest way method to deduce it? You can do it with this guy too, combining, right, these two, but easier is just do the trapezoid rule, right, which is, like this, to integrate this guy, you get that guy, okay? So here we have three methods, which I want to discuss a little bit further with you, because it's all, it's all very simple. And, and some of these things could be discussed with undergraduates, and it's not, and could be actually discussed even in some of the numerical books, and it's not, and it's very simple. So I have three methods now. So I'll call this trap. Okay, so I have order explicit, order implicit, and trap. Okay? So, so let's look now. I think this is the point I want to mention. What's, there's, there's some geometric interpretations. I don't, I don't want to mention this. Okay, there's one thing here Okay, that I want to remember. So this method here. The two Euler methods. What is the order of accuracy of the Euler methods? So I'll leave it like that. I mean, right? And then I'll, I'll, you might be, oh, what? No, let's leave it like that. So if I say any more, I, I, I answer the question for you. What's the order of accuracy of the Euler method? You answer as you wish. If you want to add detail to my question, you should. So, and if you're puzzled, I mean, take a guess, and if you're wrong, no big deal. 
we're starting to learn the subject. What is the order of accuracy of both the Euler equations, Euler methods, sorry. It's, they're actually the same. One, first order, right? So why? Yeah, but look, for example, here, the truncation there, I'm throwing away delta x squared. So why is it first order? You see? Very good. Because this is the local error, right? And you can do like an asymptotic, an asymptotic thing, which is this is local. And if you, if you go boom, 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 and you do this n times, right, the error so let me put it here so I don't go there. So the error is going to be n times delta x squared. OK? My delta looks almost like a gradient. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so delta x squared. And you, can, and you can see that n is order asymptotically 1 over delta x. Right? Because it's a time interval, blah, blah. Right? So that's why it's correct. It's first order. And the reason is this, because local is delta x, and you accumulate several types. And then we're going to do, as an exercise, a convergence proof, maybe next class, of Euler's method, which is very easy to do. And then we'll see also other theorems that makes our life easy for convergence tests. And we're going to see, well, indeed, we're going to do the estimates. It is delta x. So it's correct. It's first order. But this is like an easy way to, to see things. The local error is delta x to the m, the global error as an estimate, is good, should be delta x to the m minus 1. OK? That's good. First, to get a quick, a quick feeling of what's, what's going on. OK. This guy here is higher order. One is delta x squared. Somehow, these guys here will cancel. You can play with these guys here. Actually, the good thing about the Taylor series or whatever, or with the trapezoid rule, but with the Taylor series, very quick, easy. You see, these guys here, they can't, in, they, that's a game played many times. With ODs, I can play games with the Taylor series to cancel guys in the Taylor series and gain a higher order method. Right? OK. Now, here's a question. Stability. So let me already put the name of the stability I have in mind. If you look at these specialized books, you're going to see there's many. We're not even going to use whatever. Many definitions of stability. Right? We're going to use the first one is absolute stability, which is very useful, I think, in my opinion. It's very simple and, and useful. Absolute stability. So what is absolute stability? So absolute stability comes together in a package which something which comes with the test problem. Which as you as you will see in the in this course, most of the differential equations we're going to solve are very simple, right? Are like almost graduate student ODs. Wave equation, heat equation, I mean, very simple. Sometimes I might give you something more complicated, of course. Some things, not everything's, right, differential equations from undergraduate. But the thing is that if we want to design a new method, we have to first test it in the most simple problem we can think of, which we can have full control, right? So that then we can use in problems, which is a lot of my research is like that, which is scientific computing, in problems where you don't know analytically what, how the solution behaves, you have no theorem to support your solution. So you have to do very careful mathematically thinking uh, 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 tests until you gain confidence. That's actually you're going to put in your paper to convince the referee that you have systematically taken your numerical model to an unknown region where it very likely, maybe in the future, some might prove a theorem that the solution will behave like this, the associated physics is like that, and da da, -da. But as mathematicians, you've got to give, first of all, an indication that there's strong evidence that I'm doing the right thing. There's no, as I'll teach you here, no spurious behavior. We're going to see this in just a second. No spurious behavior of my discrete operator in comparison with my continuum operator. Right? And that's a very interesting thing. And actually, I always say this in this course, too. When I was a postdoc, there was this meeting that only saw this, this poster once, but the, 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 the title of the meeting was very good because the two words do not commute. And the title of the conference was The Numerics of Dynamics, 
that's what actually we want. Dynamics in a very general sense, be it dynamical systems, be it right, uh, PDEs, whatever, or, or interest in this, or methods that evolve in time. Right? So, so the numerics of dynamics and the dynamics of numerics. The two words don't commute. And some people, I've seen papers which are, when I was in my postdoc, which were wrong, that they were saying they were doing the numerics of dynamics, and what they were doing is the dynamics of the numerics, interesting stuff, saying they always, we see chaos here and da-da. And the bad thing about it was that they were switching the words, because it's, if you want to publish something and you say it's the dynamics of the numerics and you explain why, that's very good. That's a contribution, because even if you see weird things and you can't quite control, somebody might come in and fix it, or even yourself, by seeing the weird things, you will fix the numerical method because you understood what the numerical method was doing wrong. So we'll see an example right now of something which I call a spurious behavior, which means it's not genuine of the differential equation. It's due to the discrete machine, not the continuous machine. That is the discrete operator, not the continuous operator. And if you understand that, you might even, and if it's interesting, it's fine. You can publish a paper of the dynamics of the numerics, which is the dynamics of a discrete object. And it might be interesting on its own. And it might be helpful for you to, f to then do the other part, right? So this is very important. Okay. So absolute stability then is related to the test problem, a super simple problem, which is this. It's like, you know, you have a, a car, stability, you want to check the stability of your car. You don't go to a highway in Germany where you can drive at 200 kilometers an hour, no, <laughs> to an autobahn. You go to an oval by yourself and you ride and you check the stability of a car. You go to a simple scenario, right? So this is the test problem. I'm, I'm still going to use it. So this is the definition of a test problem. I mean, how simple can that be, right? The solution here's the solution. Okay. So wh what we know about this? Why why this test problem? Because this test problem tells us if the real part of lambda is negative the solution should decay in time. It might oscillate, depending on the imaginary part, whatever, but it should decay in time, okay? And, and if the numerical problem doesn't do that, whoop, there's something wrong, okay? So out of curiosity, I always like to see, you know, from also, your back, how much of you have heard of the test problem before? Nobody. So see, and it's super simple. I mean, this, I can, we can teach this to all, all your undergraduate friends, at home, whatever, it's so simple. You're going to see. And it's, it, it doesn't show up many, many often in books. Right? Look at this. I'm going to do now the test problem for our three candidates. I'm going to ask you if you want to buy order implicit, order explicit, or trapezoidal rule, depending on the problem. I just got to check time because today I got to finish before 10 because of a meeting. OK? So let's do that. We have time for that. I can do my salesman talk in just a second. So this is the test problem. Okay, and I'm going to go fast for some things. You can double check, it's, a, it's in the notes, and it's, I say, undergraduate exercise. Okay, so let's do the test problem for both Euler's and trapezoidal rule. So if I do this for, let me put it here. Let's see if I can do, start doing the three of them here because of the video, so we stay in one, one blackboard, right? That's why sometimes my blackboard that gets too many things, but just so we can say. Explicit Euler, okay, so let me copy from the notes so that I don't have to do all the calculation and I don't, don't do anything wrong. Look. I know I'm doing this here. Yeah, I'm doing for a specific case. Oh, here it is. Yeah, I knew it by heart, but I just don't want to. Okay, so I'm just changing the notation a little bit. I'm calling H, the spatial, the, the spacing delta x, H, right, so that don't, I write a little less. Okay, so what did I do here? Whoops. 
and I forgot this here, and I think it's like this. Okay, you double check, right? If it, it doesn't matter if I got it wrong. I think I have it right. So what did I do here? Very simple. Okay, I'm just gonna say, I use this Euler method. Where's the explicit one? Here, right? F is lambda y n, right? So h, h delta x, I'm gonna eventually call it z, a complex number because I'm saying lambda is complex, okay? And then, if I, it's like a recurrence relation, I can plug it in, go backward, 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 backward. This is the exact solution of my difference equation, right? I came backward in time all the way to the initial condition by using Euler n times, okay? It's easy, right? I don't think I have this wrong, plus one here, no, I don't think, you, you double check, okay? But I think it's right. So now, what do I have to do for the test problem? Look, if this then is my exact solution of my difference equation for this super simple problem, and I want to make sure this guy, lambda, has negative real part, I want to make sure this guy passes the test problem, I need to ask, in mathematics we know this, Right? We abuse sometimes of language, but it's not a problem. I need to ask that the amplification factor, but that's the name um, numerically, be smaller than one. This is the stability condition. Well, what is the amplification factor? It's this. I need to ask that one, oops, one plus z be less than one where z is h lambda complex. Because if the, if the absolute value of this guy is less than one, I take it to the n power and it, it doesn't grow. Because I know that my numerical, sol my exact solution will not grow in time. Super simple, I mean, teach it this, right? So this is called the amplification factor, right? In mathematics, we abuse it, which is, if the amplification factor is small than one, it's actually a contraction factor. If it's bigger than one, it's in, it's in instability. Now look at this. So I love this because it's super simple. This is the same as saying that, right? Which means that my region of absolute stability in the Z complex plane is this, which means, right, where z, right, where z is h lambda, which means I have to use a small enough time step so that I, inside this region here, which is this disk, disk centered at minus one. And you, you can do this by hand, actually. Put, Take, put, in the, it's in the notes, you, I did it by hand. You put, that's what, put lambda equal to minus one, and you will see that if you're outside the disk, the solution starts oscillating and growing, right? Or just sometimes goes fast and so on. So this is the region of absolute stability for, of course, for Euler, Explicit. If we do the same for Euler implicit, maybe I'll go over here, it's getting to, to grams. So for Euler implicit, okay, it's implicit. Do I have to use Newton's method? No, right? This is just okay. I don't, I don't have to use Newton's method in some linear systems. This will be like the inverse of a matrix. You'll see this maybe not today, but next class. Very simple too. So therefore, this gives me that the 
amplification factor plus stability condition says that 1 minus z has to be greater than 1. Am I going too fast? No, right? Because if I start moving this back and then I do the y, man minus y is equal to this format, this goes to squared, then y minus 1, blah, 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 blah. I need that this guy be smaller than 1. This guy be smaller than 1 means that this guy is greater than 1. OK? Very simple. If I'm going too fast, OK. Then you, you, f you do it on your own time because it's very simple. But I'm not going too fast. OK, so this is the stability condition. And here is the region of absolute stability, z complex. Here's the region of absolute stability for for um, implicit Euler. Here's a disk centered at 1, but it's outside. OK? So I, I'm not even going to write this, but it's very simple. So Euler, OK, so Euler explicit is conditionally stable for the test problem. Because I have to put the point, I have to choose, right? Z is already in the left half plane, because it's real part negative. I have to put the point, I have to choose the delta x where the point goes inside this disk of stability. Now implicit Euler, I don't have to do anything. So it's unconditionally stable. The thing is that if I use a delta x big, my solution will be bad because the accuracy is not good. But it will not grow. You see, that's the thing. It will not grow. If I put the delta x big, the solution will be bad. But it will not grow. Because the amplification factor here is less than 1. And if we do for the trapezoidal rule, OK, if I do for the trapezoidal rule, it's a mixture of both. Let me, let me go straight. Well, it's going to be this. Let me put. OK? And look, if I write this like this, let me actually write it like this. It's more interesting. OK? What does this remind you in complex variables? Mobius transformation, or linear fractional transformation, which maps the half plane on the disk, the disk, right? Very good. So the region of, you can check this any way you like. Looks like it. The region of absolute stability of the trapezoidal rule is the left half plane. So it's also unconditionally stable for the test problem. OK? Good? OK, Master? It looks like you're thinking something. OK, good. So, that's, so we have then three methods that look pretty much the same and that have stability properties which are, are kind of different. Right now, if I ask you which method would you buy, you still would say, wait a minute, Mr. Salesman, I need to know where I'm going to use this. I don't buy something for no use, right? I have to know how I'm going to use it. OK, so here's the problem. Here's the thing that then it, it gets me sometimes anxious. Let me get a little bit of water. That all this is undergraduate, right? You can teach an undergraduate colleague and so on, right? It's very, very simple. And what am I about to say? You even see less in books, right? This that I'm talking about, of course, you see in some books, right? I mean, you see in books. Absolutely, you see in books. What I'm about to say, <clears throat> excuse me, is what you don't see so much in books. This, this is, of course, you see. And what I'm about to say, I think there are some books that mention about this, but not, not so much. This should be in every book, which is this. OK, we had this hypothesis to understand absolute stability as a preliminary first test. If our numerical method does not pass this test, ciao. I don't want it. Now look at this. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Excuse me. If I give you, now I'm going to just throw it like this. Talk in the middle of the corridor with your colleague, right? No blackboard. 
If I give you a problem, an oscillatory problem, right? Okay, mass spring is a, is a second order OD, which we can write it as a system. We're going to see systems soon, whatever. But just think of this. If I give you an oscillatory problem, for example, like a mass spring, which method would you use of these three? And why? Now, I'm selling my equipment to specialists. I want, there are some salesmen like that. They want to sell, and they want to know the customer leaves the store happy because he's not selling just to make money. Okay? So if I have an oscillatory problem, which method would you choose? And I already give you a first hint. I don't want Euler explicit. Euler explicit can be okay for some problems. I don't want it for free if I'm using an, if I'm solving an oscillatory problem. And tell me why I don't want it for free. It's very simple, but the fact, the fact that probably you've never been posed this question, never saw it, makes you think, of course. I mean, it's not, it's, you're going to see. If I, I explain what I'm about to explain, you're going to answer everything in two seconds because it's, it's easy. But you see, it's a pity that, right? So look at this. If I am solving an oscillatory problem, lambda, which, is, which will be eventually an eigenvalue of a matrix, is purely imaginary. The solution is e to the i theta t. It's oscillatory, sine or cosine. Therefore, look at this. I do this, you already know the answer. I, I'm dead. I cannot get this guy inside the disk. Even if I make delta, delta x smaller, 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 I cannot get it inside the disk. Super simple, right? Geometrically, the explanation is here. OK? Everybody with me? If you have any doubts, ask, right? Because lambda is going to be e to the i theta. I'm violating this, which is OK. It's for the, I'm, no big deal violating this. This, this was a sp specific test. Now, for, we understood the problem. Let this go, right? It doesn't have to be, have a negative real part. For example, if it's purely imaginary, it's here. It will not work for this problem. I might ask you to do this. This is a good exercise. Do it in MATLAB so you, or whatever program just to test and see it for let it, right, it, right off your face. Now, if I do this for implicit Euler, I have it here. And if I do it for trapezoid, I have it here. Now, question for you. Which one you want? I'll give it for free or for five reais. Because if you pay a little bit, then you're a little cautious. For free, you get, OK, if you give me everything. For free, you want Take home junk if you want. No, no, for five reais, you have to pay a little bit, a bus ride. <laughs> for an oscillatory problem, which method would you choose? Implicit Euler? OK, who else? Let's see. No, I have four customers here. Trapezoid? OK. Anybody else? Or people want to wait? for the first customers to leave the store and see if they're happy or sad. <laughs> no, let's go. Already, we got two, two guys, and I have to leave for a meeting. I would buy the trapezoidal rule, not implicit oil. You know why? Because, because the border of a region where an amplification factor, right, the border is equal to 1, which means it's kind of a, a rotation if you think complexly, right? Just a, a, a numerical. A complex number, which has modulus 1, which is so it's e to the i theta, right? Some theta, whatever. So therefore, look at this. Let me go for Euler, Euler implicit y first. Here, it's the region where the amplification factor is already smaller than 1, which means this guy will decay in time. And this guy here will not decay in time. Since I have an oscillator, this model here, this discrete operator here for implicit order has a spurious artificial damping. The damping mechanism is due to the discrete model. It's not in my original physical, mechanical, whatever model. I might have a model that has damping, fine. I mean, but I need to have control. So the damping is what I call spurious because it's not genuine of the mathematical model I, I want to understand, I want to study. It's a mechanism due to the discretization. Okay? So implicit Euler 
is good for some problems, but for an oscillator, it will decay. And this one will not. You put it on your program, MATLAB, whatever, and you see. Okay? So therefore, if, if lambda, let me put it like this, is purely imaginary, okay? Imaginary, then trapezoid is the best. Implicit Euler has spurious damping, right? Which is this region here. This region here on the right half, right half plane, let me put it like this, right half plane, right? This this colored region here on the right half plane is the region which indicates the spurious damping, <coughs> independent of the problem. Why? <coughs> Excuse me. Because in the right half plane, my eigenvalue, if I have a system in the matrix, the eigenvalue has a positive real part. The solution should grow, and it will be decaying. Right? OK, so these are. Um, these are important things. I have still a little bit more time. Maybe let me go to the other side so I don't have to erase too much. So you should agree, right? This is all very simple. Mathematics, mathematics, very simple. Complex numbers, which you don't even have to know linear fractional transformation, Mobius transformation, right? You just can check the, the absolute value. So very simple. So if I have a system. Okay, in the notes now I'm using, using T, so let me shift to T. Oh, okay, now I'm starting time from zero. Who cares? Right, I can start in time. So this is a linear system. This is a matrix, right? Okay. And how do I connect this? With the, with, the, with the test problem, oh, very simple, right? So if I say that A is diagonalizable, right? And I write that W is um, M minus 1 A. I decouple the system, and I have this, right? Just do the calculation. Just check, right? Very simple. And the matrix here is, is and, it, and let's put it constant coefficients, right? Does not depend on time, right? So that things work, okay? Let me put this here, so. Content mix. So basically, see, we have here sort of N test problems, right? So if you have a system, you can think, and it's linear, right? It's like a superposition of guys, whatever. So you can think exactly as we thought. And basically, how am I going to how am I going to choose now delta t instead of delta x? But it's time. Right? I'm going to have to use a delta t here that satisfies all my eigenvalues, right? So let's think, for example, okay, this is a problem that everything decays. All the eigenvalues have negative real part, right? But I think I'm going to show you in this next class, there's some very nice problems. I think this one I got from Lambert also. Very nice problem. Simple, but very nice, which is I have all my eigenvalues are negative. But I have to choose a delta x so that I put all of them inside the unit disk, or else some of the components or some of the eigenmodes, or the solution, the direction of some eigenvector might start growing and will contaminate the whole solution if I don't put all the eigenvalues inside my disk. Right? You see what I'm talking? So that's, that's how we should think for 
right, for systems. Okay. Okay, one more thing. Maybe I'll, f I'll finish here because it's a good point to finish. So one, one good exercise sometimes I give for you to do, we'll see. I might give you because it's simple, but here it is. On the computer, just actually to double check, it's very, very easy. But it's very nice, very good. It's good to have on video for people if you want to try it at home. Right? Sometimes some things you show things, don't try this at home. No, no. Try this at home. This is a very simple linear system, constant coefficients, right? Of course, these parameters here, epsilon and delta, are greater than zero because of the sign, so make sure. So what does this, so what is this, why is this system good? Because with this system, you can play mentally, mentally you can play in the complex plane without ever using a complex number in the computer. Because many times in the computer it's good to avoid, depending on what you're doing, right? It's, I have codes with computer that does conformal mapping, which is great, but to avoid sometimes being careful using com complex numbers, if you can break it into real and imaginary parts, usually it's better to program like that, right? So why is this? Because if I put, for example, epsilon equals to zero, what do I have? I have imaginary eigenvalues. So I have an oscillator, right? If I put epsilon less than, less than zero, I have a, a negative real part. I mean, like in the test problem situation, right? Just check the eigenvalues of this guy, right? So therefore, you can play with this and, and play in the complex plane and, and see all what's happening with the test problem, OK? So this is a very good, good toy to play with, uh, with, uh, with our numerical methods. OK, so I think today is a good point to stop here because I have to go to a meeting. OK, and then I'll come back to this um, ne next class. Obrigado.